All right, so today we are doing chapter five of The World Needs a Father. And so um, today's chapter is on A Father Provides Security. So a little bit of a review. Um, so we've already talked in, in week one, we talked about the, um, the, the significance and the importance of a father in a child's life and how uh, it determines the success or, or um, lack of success of a child in their life. And ultimately we define success as um, if they're uh, fulfilling their destiny, right? Um, so we did that in chapter one. Uh, we saw the needs, uh, the important need of fathers, uh, good godly fathers. Uh, then in uh, week two, uh, we talked about fathers surrounding themselves with what we call a band of brothers, other godly men, because uh, um, so they can support one another, pray for one another, exhort one another. Um, and uh, just generally um, walk through life together. Um, and then we talked uh, another week about, now we're talking about the roles of the father in a child's life. So we talked, the first one was that the father provides authority in the family. He's the authority, he provides the authority. And we talked about what authority is and what authority is not. Um, and, um, and that we, we also talked about the father represents God on earth. So um, in, in the mother-father relationship, we talked about the father represents God and the mother represents the body, right? And so it's like a role play, if you will, uh, of the father, you know, uh, uh, loves God like, like, like God loves the church, right? Uh, like, like it says in Ephesians 5. And so um, he represents God and the, the, what the mom represents the body and how we sweetly submit to, um, our heavenly father. Uh, but then how our heavenly father honors and lifts up and cherishes us. Um, so, um, and then we talked last week, um, the, the, uh, so the, the uh, fathers, uh, provide authority, but they also confer identity is what we talked about last week. They confer the identity, the uniqueness, who they are in God. Um, um, you know, that they're, they're heirs, uh, they have unique spiritual gifts and that sort of thing. So this week we're talking about the third role of the father, which is a father provides security. All right. So um, let me open up the PowerPoint. And there we go. All right. So pro father provides security. All right. So, um, you know, we think security, we think, you know, a sword or, uh, you know, things like that. But what we're going to talk about this in the context of love, of, of security also means like a safe place to be right and god's kingdom is certainly a safe place to be and where our father represents god he provides a safe place in the home all right so we're going to talk about four ways a father provides security in the home and the four ways are creating an environment of love emotional stability communication healthy communication and physical safety these are the four aspects of security a father um, is to provide. All right, so we'll just read through these. So Psalm 27, one to five, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I, 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 I can feel secure. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock, right? So God, God provides a safe place for us to be. And dads, as the representative of God, the father, um, provide the same. And Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. All right, um, so I'm just going to read through these. Let me find it here. First John 4. I'm, gonna, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. I'm just going to read through from uh, 4.1 to, I think, 4.18. Where are we? Yeah, 
All right. So it says God is love. Those who are loved by God, let his love continuously pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God, for God is love. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. And delightfully, loved ones, if he loved us with such tremendous love, then, uh, then loving one another should be our way of life. No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of God's splendor. If we love one another, God makes his permanent home in us and we make our permanent home in him and his love is brought to its full expression in us. And he has given us his spirit within us so we can have the assurance that he lives in us and that we live in him. Moreover, we have seen with our own eyes and can testify to the truth that Father God has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Those who give thanks that Jesus is the son of God live in God and God lives in them. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love and we trust in the love he has for us. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so we are in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. So much in that. There's so much richness in that of what love is. And, and that our source of love is comes from God, right? We can manufacture good deeds, good intentions, you know, things like that. But um, it's when, when we become the vessel to receive his love and let that pour out through us. That's the ultimate love. And that's what pro provides a safe home, a safe place, right? Um, or as it says here, creating an environment of love. All right. Okay. Um, love is their mom. Love them. Yeah. Um, so how does a dad show this? Well, here's three little quick ways. Love the mother. Like like God loves us, like, like God, like God loves the church, love them unconditionally, no strings attached. Um, I think I want to actually, I didn't plan on doing this. Uh, I wrote, actually wrote a poem that I was in my prayer time, uh, last week. If I see if I can find this really quickly, uh, it just kind of captures it all. Here we are. Um, in my prayer time with God, I was just suddenly infused uh, with a wave of intense, uh, sweet love from the Lord. And so this is what I wrote. It says, God, teach me to love. I want to love like there's no tomorrow with the power that holds all the stars in place. I want to love until there's nothing left to give. And yet somehow there is more. I want to love with no expectations or returns and be completely satisfied. I think that this is the secret to abundant life. Teach me to love like you. And so I, um, I wrote that from the flow of my heart <laughs> and uh, I, I felt that was, you know, as I was writing it, I was hearing Jesus right? He loved with no expectation for return. He just loved, right? He just sacrificed himself. He just loved 
with no expectations. He wants, he wants us to come into relationship with him. He wants us to love him back, but he doesn't expect it, right? And he still died the most horrible death ever, regardless of that. Um, so that's loving unconditionally. Um, and then love them equally, love our children equally. All right. I, um, a little, um, a few a minute, just doing a lot of ministry with children. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of kids come and, and say, you know, they have a new baby brother or new baby sister. And, um, you know, sometimes they're a little concerned or jealous of the new little baby because of how much attention it's getting from mom and dad. And, um, and so I, I explain this to them because they feel like they're, they're not loved so much or they're concerned. So I, I, I use this little story. I say, you know, um, if let's say you have a little puppy, a, a little, a little puppy dog and, or a kitten and, uh, and you love that puppy so much, right? Like you would just love it. You would care for it. You would feed it, take it for walks. You would just love this little puppy. And let's just say another puppy came a year later. And I said, would you have to take $100? Um, I, I put it in dollars. Let's say you love um, this first puppy $100 worth. Um, and then a new puppy came. You know, would you take $50 of love from puppy number one and give it to puppy number two? So they're loved equally at $50 each. And they said, no, that's silly. Right. And I said, right. So love is like that, right? Love multiplies. Somehow, miraculously, love just multiplies. So I said, when your mom had you, she loved you more than $100, right? It's unmeasurable. So now she has a new, you have a new baby brother or sister. She's not going to take half of the love for you and give it to the new baby. It's the love she has for you will multiply and you will have even more love and the new baby sister or brother will have even more love. That's the way love is. So loving equally, I see that. That's how I would describe loving equally. All right, so how we love, all right. So um, this is earthly ways that we love, right? So we say, um, uh, I'm gonna love you, but in exchange, I expect you to make me happy and give me something in return, right? You know, like here it says security, significance, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it could be uh, material things, right? We've, <laughs> that happens, um, or, um, or we love by, uh, let's think specifically about children here. Um, we, we, we love by, um, um, by centering our whole life around our children, right? Um, that that we, we, we bypass everything else and the child becomes like an idol in our lives, right? Um, or um, we, uh, when we love, we give them the power um, uh, to determine um, um, so one sec, uh, to determine, um, who we are, how we feel, right. Um, if they're acting up, um, it, 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 and we're idolizing them, it gives them the power over us to determine, uh, how our day is going to go. Right. Uh, rather than God determining how our day is going to go. Um, or we love, by um of, of having expectations like my you're you know you're going to be a lawyer just like me or you're going to be a teacher just like me or you're going to be a missionary right um so we're projecting our expectations um uh, or or also if i if i love you and i treat you well then i can i'm, I'm going to mold and shape you pardon me, shape you into what I expect you to be. You're going to be a good girl or a good boy, right? And, uh, and we almost find our identity from um, how our children behave. Um, um, let's see here. All right. So idolatry, all of those things really are idolatry that I just described. Those ways of loving are actually forms of idolatry. 
So um, point number one says, I look to you to supply things only God can supply, right? So, you know, I think of little Bobby, right? Goes and plays soccer and he scores lots of goals. That makes me happy, right? Or um, he gets all A's in school, right? That makes me happy or makes me feel like a good parent because my little Bobby is, is doing so well in things, right? Um, so um, that's a form of idolatry, right? And, um, um, or you become the center of my life orientation. So we've, we've, we've seen, I, I know I live in Canada, so this may not be everywhere, but uh, certainly in North America, um, you know, children are, um, are um, doted upon, um, you know, um, uh, moms and dads, you know, lose contact with friends even because there's such a, a, a focus on the child. Now, don't get me wrong, we need to be intentional about raising our children, uh, but we have to determine where is the center of our life coming from? Uh, where is our orientation towards? And it can very easily turn toward the child and away from God. All right. Um, uh, like we are, we already talked about this, we carve out an idol in our minds of what they, we want them to become, right? Ideally, we want them to become what God created them to be, the destiny that he created for them, because each one of us is born with a very specific, unique purpose that no one else can fill. And so ideally, that's what we want to, uh, to help them uh, become. Um, yeah, here again, controlling and manipulating. And, and they become our idols. All right. The impact of idolatry. Okay. Um, um, here in North America, we've seen this often when there's an empty nest is a term we use when the children are all now grown up and moved away from home. And the, and the, the parents just all of a sudden realize they have no relationship between the two of them. Everything was focused on the child. And so now there's nothing left. And a lot of times divorces happen um, when both the children leave the home. Um, so um, um, uh, yeah, so that, that's idolization. Um, all right, We've, we're, 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 I'm, these are kind of reiterations. I'm just reading down here. Uh, all right. Okay. So, um, so in conclusion with the idolization is that we cannot ultimately love anyone that we idolize, right? Because if we're idolizing it, um, we're worshiping it, we're not loving it, right? And those are not the same thing, um, uh, necessarily. And, um, and, let, and let's um, actually I'll go through the second point at the heart of most misery, anger and frustration is a dis disappointed expectation rooted in self-love. So let's take the example of I want my Bobby to score lots of goals in soccer and be a super duper athlete. Right. Well, really, that's about that's not about loving him. I could pass it off as that. Oh, I want my Bobby to learn teamwork. I want my Bobby to learn, um, you know, to be physically fit and have an active lifestyle. You know, I want my Bobby to make friends through sport. I could pass it off as that. I could. But if I look deep, deep down, possibly um, what I'm doing is seeing that um, I, I'm, you know, um, uh, a high ranking mom, mom because my son is so good at sports or in school. Right. Or with how many friends he has. Right. Um, so ultimately, that's rooted in self-love and promoting myself. Uh, and not um, uh, um, and not loving Bobby. All right. So three mistakes we make. Our love is externally determined. Okay. So in this case, not Christ, but you are the source of my love. The, the child is the source of our love, and therefore you have the right to make me miserable. So what that means is is when the child is not succeeding, it it um, it it you know it brings our life down. But when they're succeeding, it brings our life up, uh, so to speak. So, um, so that's an externally determined love. It's determined by performance and the performance of someone else, not us. All right. Um, or it's exchange determined means 
you need to return my love because I scratched your back, right? And, you know, I want to say, I'll just, I'll, I'll share uh, personally, when I wrote that uh, poem that I, I read off uh, just a few minutes ago, um, I was actually had just experienced another healing from, um, from God because uh, I, you know, uh, had an exchange with my daughter, uh, my, my adult daughter, and um, uh, that wasn't pleasant. And um, I, I was, I got off the phone and I was not uh, happy. <laughs> I was, I wasn't angry. I was hurt. Um, I was definitely hurt. I, uh, maybe a little bit angry. Um, um, and and, I, and I, I took it to God and I said, God, why am I feeling like this? Like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. And, and, and he showed me, he said, um, um, you're expecting love in, in return uh, for your love. And I was immediately convicted of, oh, right. And, and, and then as he ministered to me, that's when I wrote the poem. And it said on the uh, one of the lines was, um, I want to love with no expectations or returns. So I even said, I said, God, if I can learn to love better by loving someone and them not returning that love, then I'm going to become a better lover. I, I will be a, be a better lover of people. So it's like uh, James 1, 2, 3. Be, uh, 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 I'm paraphrasing. Uh, find joy in many trials, right? Uh, uh, that we, uh, I, I can be a better, more like him by being tested. So that's, what I, that's why I wrote that line uh, uh, with no returns. I want to be able to love people and not expect and not get anything in return. That will make me better at loving. All right. Um, all right. Uh, expectations determined. You have to meet the expectations of my love. So, you know, you could say uh, uh, to, the, to the child, um, I'm, I'm going to love you, but, uh, and your, how you love me needs to meet these parameters. You need to be obedient. You know, you need to uh, never speak up, never question me. Um, you need to do really well in sports. You need to do really well in school. Uh, you name it. I'm, I'm picking some of the main ones we would have in North America. All right. Okay. So fathering that creates fear, shame, and guilt. All right. So here's, we're going to stop at the top of this cycle. So this is a cycle, a, a relational cycle, right? Um, so let's say father has expectations, right? Uh, a like, um, yeah, so that takes us to the next one, which, which drives performance, right? So the child learns if the father's leading with expectations uh, of little Bobby, um, then that drives him to want to perform and please his dad. All kids, every kid wants to please their parents, right? Um, and they want to please their parent uh, because they want to feel accepted right? Uh, they want to feel loved. They want to feel safe, which is our, our, our topic for today, safety, right? So all children, they will start to perform. Um, um, so in other words, that's how a lot of them are in sports or in school um, is because they want to earn their parents' love, right? All right. So that then leads to disappointment because ultimately expectations are human nature whatever we have expectations and they're fulfilled, we upgrade those expectations to want more of the same thing because it makes us feel good, right? And when those are, are achieved, then we increase our expectations and they keep going higher and higher and higher. So what happens is, right? Um, so here we are, performance. So at some point, there's gonna be some disappointment because we're not going to achieve the performance levels, right? We're going to miss a goal. We're going to get a, a, a C or a D or an F on a report card, right? Um, uh, and then that leads to guilt and shame, right? Uh, um, and that leads to either increased expectations or driving those expectations home even harder. Right. So let's say, um, you know, little Bobby and report cards. Okay. Um, 
you know, and maybe I might be speaking from a little bit of experience on this <laughs> um, with, my, with my son. Um, I remember um, uh, both my children are very intelligent, um, and, uh, but Kevin loves to work with his hands more. That that's his thing. And uh, there were certain subjects in school um, that, you know, he was getting, uh, I think, a C or, or a, yeah, a C. And um, uh, I mean, it's grade school. Anybody can get an A, really. Um, it's not that hard. Um, and so I was setting goals for him on his report card. Well, let's let's move that C up to a B for the next term, right? So I was setting expectations and uh, that were mine, not his own goals. And um, so we entered into this. Now I was a single parent, so uh, no dad there. Um, anyways, uh, and this whole cycle. So what, what, what rises up out of this kind of cycle? Fear. Fear of failure from the performance. Fear of not being loved, right? Fear of disappointment, right? Um, and, and, and this, this is the environment that's created when we have, uh, when dads set an example of love based on expectations. All right. So our love versus God's love. What does that look like? Let's do, uh, uh so we talked about in the uh, second last slide, externally sourced, right? Uh, but God's saying, right, um, Christ in me. Uh, Christ in us is the source of our love, right? Just like it said in 1 John uh, 4, right? When, when we know his love, it pours out from us and through to the children, all right? Um, it's also one directional and unconditional. Whereas, let's go back here. There's an exchange determined. I love you, you love me. I love you, you love me, right? But in God's world, it's one directional and not conditional on any expectations, right? Um, God says he does not need anything from us in exchange for his love. So a dad and even a mom um, does not expect anything in exchange for his love. All right. Um, and also God's love is intentionally driven, right? Um, so there's no ex expectation from him about us. No, none at all. He just loves. And that's it. All right. A little bit more about how God loves. It's one-sided. We already talked about that, irrespective of return. There's no expectations, no manipulation. He just loves. He keeps on forgiving, always, always forgiving, always, every day, <laughs> forgiving, right? Um, and um, like, because it says, it says that uh, he died for us even be, even while we were sinning, or for us who who were born after Jesus, even before we started sinning, he died, right? It was self it self sacri he sacrificed himself for it, right? He sought, he became sin, right? For us, he became our sin for us. Okay, uh, and he gives us, uh, he gives and gives from the inside out. He gives from his heart, right? And, and a dad, remember talking internal versus external, right? Internal, um, you know, if we're internally filled so much with his love um, that that pours out from us, that he get, we, a dad gives from the inside out. And so do moms. Yeah. All right. If we really love like God loves, we will not have any selfish, ex selfish expectations. We will not try to manipulate or control. We will keep on forgiving. Woo, we definitely need to do that. And we will break down all idols, right? And, you know, um, let's be gracious with ourselves because God is gracious with us. You know, uh, my daughter is 26. All right. And, um, I had to forgive, I had to forgive her uh, just last week when I wrote that poem, right? 
it's kind of a never ending cycle. So we, we need to be continually breaking down the idols, right? Um, um, that, that journey, we live in earth, we live in a sinful world. So that's a, a daily, well, maybe not a daily, but it's an ongoing uh, uh, process. All right. So love that creates no fear. There's freedom and joy. All right. So I think I have, uh, let's see here. All right. So intentional love creates no fear. All right. Remember, fear is the opposite of love. So remember uh, a couple of slides ago. Let's just go back. There we are. Fear is at the center, right? Fear driven. All right. And now we're looking at the opposite of that is love driven. So let's look at the opposite now, the opposite cycle. We start up at the top. It starts with a heart of abundance, right? So like in First John uh, 4, um, you know, a heart, a, a person, that, a, a dad or mom that is so immersed in God's presence that has such a complete, not just understanding, but embracing of God's love for him or her as a mom. There's a, there's a spirit of abundance, the right, that just manifests it's there's no end to his love there's no beginning there's no end and it's full everywhere in between there's an abundance to that so that so a dad is a parenting from an abundant mindset and heart position all right and that then um there's an outpouring of that that gushes out where where dad shares that grace it pours out to the children and the mom for that matter right it pours out right just like jesus poured out his heart for us right and then that leads to appreciation right um rather than um i've got to remember the opposite uh flow chart was um, I've got to achieve, I've got to, I've got to do this to make my father happy. But instead, the child is receiving the, the grace. Um, then there's an appreciation, right? Um, uh, that comes like with that acceptance, that embracing. And that leads for the child to a sense of freedom and joy, right? Um, and that then pours back in to the source of abundance to the dad, which increase and amplifies the abundance right and the cycle uh, it's an upward cycle it's an abundant cycle right and there's no fear or i wish i'd put in there it's love right but there's no fear there's no place for fear in here right and and this is a place where wherever every child you know, um, if I if I had done it differently with my my son when he was younger, um, you know, he wouldn't have been afraid to show me his report card, right? Um, uh, or it, um, I always approached sports in in a healthy way, but um, you know, he wouldn't have been afraid to not score the goal or to miss, right? Um, or to, even just to make a mistake at home, spill the milk, you know, or you know, burn the toast, right? He wouldn't, there would have been no fear. Now, I, I, yeah, oh, I won't get into specifics. So, so in conclusion on, so remember, we, uh, uh, we talked about um, uh, the way uh, uh, a dad provides security. And the first one is through an environment of love. So in conclusion for the environment of love section um, is the value of a person will not be determined by what we can get for a return in return from them. The value of the child is that they give me an opportunity to love as I have been loved by Jesus, right? I get to role play that. I get to pass it on. Um, and the more useless uh, they are, the more valuable they become. So in other words, I guess this is like where Paul is saying, my strength comes through my weakness, right? All right. Okay. So number two. So remember, today is about um, uh, the dad provides security. And the first one was, uh, does that by creating an environment of love? Okay. Number two, emotional security, right? So let's talk about that now. Uh, there's four ways that a dad can provide emotional security. All right. So um, let's talk about the definition of resonance because I, I, I looked up that meaning. And so um, I'm just going to um, um, read from a few uh, 
uh, dictionaries. One, the quality of a sound of being deep, full, and reverberating. That's what resonance means, right? So it's the quality of a sound that's deep, full, and reverberating. Or another definition is the phenomenon of increased amplitude that occurs when the frequency of an applied periodic force is equal to or close to a natural frequency. So in other words, um, it's something that resonates with nature. Um, um, and it's a phenomenon, right? When we can resonate our, our frequency uh, um, um, with something that, that can be compared to nature. And three, is to move something at a higher amplitude than it is now by functioning at that higher amplitude. You know, so we're talking about something deep, something rich, um, and we're talking about something that influences other things. It's about higher, a, a higher amplitude, a higher state of being, and it influences other things to also uh, vibrate at that higher amplitude. All right. So that's what resonance means. So let's describe it this way. Um, great leaders move us, right? So let's talk about this in terms of dads, okay? Great leaders, great dads move their children, right? A great, um, whether they're an official leader or not, sets the emotional standard of the team or the family. He's an emotionally intelligent leaders attract people. Optimistic, enthusiastic leaders more easily retain their people. The emotion people feel is the glue that holds them together, right? So a leader um, is, uh, provides the emotional glue that holds a team together, right? Emotions people feel is reflected in the quality of their work. And laughter signals the group's emotional temperature. All right, so think of a dad leading a family. I think there's a few more on the next slide, but um, I, I, let me just double check here. No, okay. So when a dad is leading a family as a great leader with resonance, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit, there's laughter in the home, right? There's a, a nucleus, the children want to be home. So we know that in teenagers, you know, they tend to stray. Now they're, they're entering a phase where they're, they need to learn about their, their community and how they fit into it. There is that part, but in, a teen, in teens, the ones that want to come home at the end of the day, that want to bring their friends home because it's a safe place to be, right? This is the sign of a good dad, right? A good leader. Um, um, and, and, and the glue that holds the family together, um, you know, he's provided an emotional atmosphere, a positive emotional atmosphere that glues the family together, right? Um, let's move on. All right. So let's talk about emotional intelligence. What is that, right? EQ, it's sometimes called, right? Um, emotional intelligence. So it's traits or behavior of the emotionally intelligent person are. Okay, an emotionally intelligent person is self-aware. They're motivated and they perceive others accurately, right? Um, they're able to manage their own emotions to create well-defined outcomes, all right? Um, uh, they're emotionally, li emotionally literate, um, recognizing what underlying emotions are being blanketed. So uh, what that, I'll just break that down. What that means is, you know, um, um, oh, what? Well, yeah, when I was talking to my daughter last week, right, and, and uh, you know, I, it was, uh, you know, hurtful what she had said, and um, so I recognized, um, I said, I feel hurt, right, so I'm, uh, that's literacy means, uh, part of literacy means uh, being able to identify the emotions, I felt hurt, I felt not loved, I felt rejected, I felt I don't, I'm not sure if I felt angry. I, I was maybe, pardon me, a little angry about that, um, uh, but mostly hurt um, and rejected. All right. So um, those 
even though on the surface I said, uh, you know, I reacted differently, I, I, like I kept my composure um, and parented her um, underneath, I was feeling these things, right? So this is what it means, the underlying emotions. Uh, if we can, we need to be able to identify what are these rumblings going on underneath and uh, deal with them. Uh, maturely. All right. Uh, emotionally intelligent person prepares for interactions with people by looking at the psychological process as well as the task. All right. So um, I always say it's always people first, task second, always, always, always. So, um, uh, so for me, I always want to understand people on my teams. Uh, I, I want to understand, uh, you know, what grieves them, what make, brings them joy, how do they like to be loved? There's a thing called the love languages. Um, uh, I wanna understand their love languages. How can I love them better? Um, um, so uh, an emotionally intelligent person is always considering the other people and, um, uh, um, and valuing them above the task, all right? Okay, and emotionally intelligent person thinks positively and does not quit easily. All right, is sincere and cleans, uh, clears things up even when it requires the difficult conversation. Yes. All right, and uh, they have an increased flexibility and are able to let go of outdated visions and plans, right? So right now in these times, a lot of things are getting outdated very quickly. So you need to be able to let go of the, um, the outdated ones and move forward quickly. All right. Uh, or in, in the right timing. It's not always quick, but uh, yeah. All right. Um, they have excellent social skills and a sense of community spirit. All right. They're resilient when it go uh, when the going gets tough, seeking mutually um, uh, seek, seeking um, mutuality in solutions. Right. So they're not uh, there is a time when a leader needs to say, okay, this is what we've got to do. Um, they're getting a direction from God, maybe, or it's, um, you know, time is of the essence and things uh, need to be done. But uh, generally, um, a good leader or a good dad, uh, it, it has a family gathering, a discussion and gets mutuality in, 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 in solving problems or making decisions. All right. Um, they proactively create a life work balance. Right, so they're not, you know, off working all the time. Uh, they're, um, um, they, yeah, they have balance. All right, uh, and they seek personal development without a sense of personal deficit. So uh, all that to say, basically, is they chase after personal development. They're not doing it because they have to, um, um, or because, I don't know, the wife said so, or, uh, you know, they're doing it because they want to. They 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 want to grow each and every day. Um, uh, in, in, you know, physically, uh, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, um, uh, relationally, financially, and every other way. All right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about, um, let's see, I want to get the context for this for self-awareness. All right. So a part of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. All right. There's four parts to emotional intelligence. First one is self-awareness. All right, uh, so emotional self-awareness. Readings one owns emotions, recognizing their impact using a gut sense to guide decisions. Uh, um, okay, so it's, um, uh, well, like we, we, like we said earlier is um, in my conversation with my daughter, I recognized there was something underneath or something in my heart that wasn't from God, right? So, um, so it's recognizing those, so being self-aware uh, or the Bible says it, take your thought captive, right? Uh, um, it's recognizing that and, um, um, and recognizing that I'm not going to let that guide my decisions. I'm not going to let that uh, guide or determine my actions, my reactions, or my words. I'm going to deal with it. All right. Um, Self-awareness means making an accurate self-assessment, -ass right? Knowing your strengths and limits. You know, if I'm, I know if I, um, you know, you know, I had that challenging conversation with my daughter. Um, I knew I needed to stop. I needed to spend some time with God and, and, and reconcile this, resolve it before taking on anything else. Because um, I would have, um, any work I would have done from that heart position would not have been good. <laughs> All right. Um, 
and self-awareness there's self-confidence um so it's knowing um what your um what your strengths and your weaknesses are um it's knowing um um what does it say here oh yeah your self-worth and your capabilities right i know uh you know we know we're loved by god we're princes and princesses uh and heirs to the throne uh and all of those things we were worthy of dying for um this is self-awareness all right so part two of emotional um intelligence is um self-management so emotional self-control keeping disruptive emotions and impulses under control just like with my daughter i knew i needed to um end the conversation fairly quickly uh and <laughs> deal with uh, what was going on but i didn't let it erupt into um a blow up with her all right um uh, and i'm saying all this guys this is just a recent example that applies here i don't always get it right i don't want you to make it think i always get it right i don't um all right so under self-management transparency displaying honesty and integrity and trustworthiness well actually displaying honesty and, and integrity is trustworthiness right and so what that means is you know I, I mean i could have said to my daughter um look holly what you just said right now was hurtful and i i i need to i need to get off the phone and i need to uh go and uh pray some some about this um that's honesty it's vulnerability as well um all right uh, self-management is adaptability flexibility and adapting to changing situations or overcoming obstacles especially with kids things are always changing right uh so we need to be able to adapt with the changing moment right um achievement um the drive to improve performance to meet inner standards of, of excellence right so different from performance orient orientation uh but we're talking about let's just call it um uh higher walks with god right um higher levels of capacity right uh yeah higher levels of capacity and function all right initiative the readiness to act and seize opportunities right as opposed to like laziness um or um um apathy indifference um yeah um, and also there's optimism, seeing the upside of events or the opportunity in a situation, right? You know, so, you know, um, you know, the opportunity to grow, for example. All right. Uh, and the third way of, of social intelligence as, as a component of, of uh, sorry, emotional intelligence, um, uh, social awareness. So there's empathy. Sensing, uh, sensing others' emotions and understanding their perspective, take an active interest in their concerns, knowing that we ourselves, we can deal with our own worries, our own emotions with God, you know, uh, we have we have dad, our heavenly dad to go to, or maybe even a close friend, if it's something that needs, you know, there's absolutely the body working together. But um, generally in social, social situations, we have the capacity to consider others and not ourselves, right? And remember, this is the opposite of what we talked about earlier about I'll love you if you love me, or I'll love you as long as you meet my expectations, or I'll love you as long as you make me look good, right? This is the opposite of that, right? This is the uh, this is looking to others and, and addressing their needs and concerns. All right, um, social awareness, organizational awareness. So uh, reading the currents, decision networks and politics at an organizational level, right? So that's a little bit more of seeing the bigger picture uh of understanding the bigger picture of what's going on here in a situation um and in service recognizing and meeting uh follower client or customer needs we kind of that kind of summarizes what we've been um talking about all right and finally uh the last part of emotional intelligence is relationship management right so inspirational leadership so it's guiding and motivating with a compelling vision as opposed to you do this you do that you do you know uh um or if you don't do this i'm gonna be mad you know um it's it's leading by um by inspiration and vision all right and um so then influence wielding a range of tactics for persuasion uh wielding is kind of a strong maybe a negative word but uh, what that means is is um um an, an emotionally intelligent uh person will know have multiple ways 
of of helping someone get to the place that God ultimately wants to be them to be, or they want to be themselves, right? It could be a direct conversation. It could be, um, oh goodness, um, it could be uh, recommending a book to them that might be helpful for them. Oh goodness, um, uh, talking indirectly. Oh, using testimony. Um, that's one I use a lot is using testimony uh, to help other people maybe see uh, s uh, something to influence other people. All right, uh, developing others. So bolstering the others' abilities through feedback and guidance. All right, uh, change, being a change catalyst. This is big. All right, so initiating, managing, and leading in a new direction. That takes a lot of emotional intelligence, uh, uh, being able to, um, uh, in this case, move a family in a new direction. Let's just say, uh, move even literally physically move to a new city, right? How you know, that's going to create unrest, uh, un uh, dissettlement, unsettlement. Um, so uh, an emotional, intelligent dad is able to um, navigate that and help people through it. Um, all right. Conflict management, obviously resolving disagreements in a healthy way, in a timely way. Um, building bonds, they cultivate and, ma and maintain a web of relationships. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Um, uh, da dads need to travel with a band of brothers, right? Um, uh, building networks um, where there's, there's accountability, there's prayer, there's support. Uh, there's just a shoulder to lean on when times get tough because we all face tough times. All right, and finally, uh, teamwork and collaboration. They know how to uh, build teams and they know how to build cooperation uh, within a team. All right. So finally, uh, for, for emotional intelligence, here's kind of a roadmap, right? Uh, so we talked about self-awareness. Here are all the things for self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relational management. Um, these, that's kind of a summary for emotional intelligence. All right. So now third, oh, did you want to take a screenshot? There we go. Take, yeah, take a screenshot if you want of that. All right. Okay. So now we have communication. So remember, we're, today we're talking about a dad provides security in the home, in the family, all right, um, as a whole, but also individually uh, for each, uh, the children and the mom. And so we talked about creating an environment of love. We talked about emotional stability. All right. And now we'll talk about the third component, communication, right? Um, so it's in broad terms, you know, when there's yelling and screaming and fighting, that's not a safe environment, right? People don't feel safe. Children don't feel safe. The mom doesn't feel safe in that. Um, neither does the dad for that, for that matter. Um, 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 all right, so let's break that down. So under communication, uh, we're going to talk about each of these five, but the components are they use clear and appropriate body language. Um, commun communication happens, happens on five levels. We're going to break that down. Um, crossing the inner barriers of communication. Again, we're going to break this down. Communicating feelings and listening skills. All right, so let's let's start. Let's look at each one of these now. All right, clear and appropriate body language. All right. So what that means? Making appropriate eye contact. So let's let's talk about eye contact. So this, right? You can be looking right at them, but. What kind of eye contact is this? So I'm talking appropriate eye contact, right? And for young children, um, uh, you know, it's good to get to kneel down or get down on their level and talk to them eye to eye. We call it eye level, right? Just give me one second here. Um, so um, uh, because, because Jesus came down to our level, right? So we can understand and relate to him. Uh, a, a parent that, um, that stands over their child is intimidating and scary. It's not safe, right? Remember, security, a dad provides security. But if a dad kneels down to, to speak to them at their eye level or sits down in a chair beside them, um, this is, uh, this is um, good body language. Um, facial expressions. You know, um, um, you know, uh, 
and this is all reflective of your relationship with Father God, um, is what kind of facial expression does he have when he talks to you? All right, and uh, use the right gestures and body language. Uh, I'll just say, um, here's an example of something that I, uh, in, my, in my marriage, uh, um, you know, was abusive. And one thing that my um, ex-husband used to do was he would do this. Like he would, he would, his, he would, he, his arms would go out, he, he'd stand up and he'd become big. And, um, I remember, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I was quite living in, in a, uh, in feelings of trauma in that marriage. So when, when someone does this, when they're talking to you, it's, I know you can't see my whole, but yeah, it's, it's traumatizing. It, it, it adds to the trauma and you don't feel safe. So right body gestures, right? Pointing fingers, right? That's, that's another one. It's you, you know? Um, uh, so body, body gestures, you know, when you, when you're talking, lean towards them, show interest, or, or, you know, even I just tilted my head that shows an interest in what the child is saying, right? Or sitting down, right? And, and like, I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna put my cell phone away, right? Um, or, or sit down, like I'm gonna sit here and listen to you as opposed to walking. I mean, sometimes let's be, let's be honest. Sometimes, I, I mean, as moms, we're cooking at the same time as we're talking, there, there's, there's times for that, of course. But, uh, but there needs to be times where, um, the right um, body language says body language speaks more than the words they say. I can't remember the percentage. It's something like 20% is of your message is your words and 80% is your body language and facial expression, something like that. Um, um, and it says keep the right distance from the from the from the child or the receiver or the mom, the receiver. It means are you in their face, right? Or are you um, you know being respectful of, of the distance? Um, and also controlling the tone of voice, right? Because you can say the same words, but a different tone of voice, it's an entirely different message. All right. And again, uh, let's think, how would Father God communicate with you? And that's how we communicate with our children. And guys, we are talking about the world needs a father, but um, moms, the, I mean, this, this all applies to moms as well. Um, these communication techniques, for example, and even the emotional intelligence and all of that stuff. All right. Um, all right. So levels of communication. Okay. Uh, so I think it's five levels, but anyway, so level one is just regular um, chit chat. It's just, you know, like, how's the weather? Um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, how are you? Just very, just baseline level stuff. Um, but level two, now we're talking about some facts, you know, hey, did you hear about you know, I don't know, a certain soccer team winning a game or, you know, or uh, um, I would say, oh, how did you do on your test? Yeah, just just kind of asking questions on a factual level. Um, but then it gets down to opinions or solutions. Okay, this is beyond, this is deeper than facts, right? Um, so you could say, um, well, let's take this question here. How did you do on your test? That's a fact question, level two. But level three, if you want to go deeper, it says, well, how did you feel about that? How do you feel about that your result on the test? How did you feel taking the test? Were you nervous? Did you feel prepared? Did you feel ready? Did you feel confident? You know, that's a level three question or conversation. Um, and then even talking about solutions, right? Okay, so um, you felt, let's just say, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, let's say I'm, uh, nervous. Okay. So level two, um, how did you do on your test? Um, level three. Okay. Um, so let's say they didn't do well. Um, um, how, level three, how did you feel about that? Well, I was, you know, I was nervous. Um, so what, what are some solutions? How could you, you know, how could you feel more comfortable next time taking a test? Cause I really would like to see you feel comfortable taking your tests. And, um, and so is there something I can help with that? Right. Actually, that takes it to another level, but uh, uh, but helping them find solutions. That's a level three. All right. Um, so we go to level four. All right. Um, so now we're talking. Yeah. Feelings. This happens when you connect with the person. Feelings level reflected. OK. Yeah. So this is where um, uh, what I did with my kids. Um, uh, once once I figured all this out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> 
is I always ask them to start with an I feel statement. Um, so like uh, talking with my daughter, I would say, you know, I would notice that she's upset or angry or something. And I would just say, okay, hold on. How are you feeling right now? Like, I want to, I just want to understand better. How are you feeling right now? I mean, it was pretty obvious, but what I'm helping her to do is develop emotional intelligence by identifying her feelings. Right. Um, and, and that, and we can also teach that by expressing our own feelings. I feel hurt when you say things like that, you know, I feel frustrated. I feel, you know, and so it's called an, I feel statement. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but, um, um, uh, but this is a level four conversation because when you're um, sharing your feelings or asking others to share their feelings, um, we're talking a uh, deeper level of vulnerability, right? Because when you share your feelings, you're open to um, uh, being judged, right? Uh, or, you know, uh, looked down upon or, or, or whatnot. All right. So level five, total transparency. So this is an intimate conversation um, experience. So th this, you know, this kind of conversation is reserved. Um, it says, don't give your pearls to the pigs, right? Uh, means um, uh, don't give your heart to uh, someone who's going to trample on it. Um, so this is, this is um, complete vulnerability, sharing deep, dark secrets, fears, concerns, worries, hurts, um, you know, um, even sinful natures and asking someone to hold you accountable. Um, that's the, that's level five. Now let, let's, let's put this all in perspective. Um, let's talk about relationship circles. Um, and I don't have a, um, yeah, I'll just here, let me just do it this way. I should have my whiteboard ready, but um, well, yeah, you know what I mean by concentric circles. Let's just do this. So you have strangers on the outside, right? And then a little closer in, you've got acquaintances that are closer to you. And then a little closer in, you've got friends, right? And then a little closer into you, you've got good friends. And then you've got confidants in the middle, right? So concentric circles. And this is how close you let them into your heart, right? Is you would not have a total, I would not, I would never share um, my deepest uh, fears and concerns and my heart aches, things that make my heart ache with <clears throat> people that are strangers, right? Because I don't know what they're going to do with that information, right? And, and likewise, I may not even share them with acquaintances, right? Um, and, but then my friends, I'll start sharing my feelings uh, with friends, uh, right. Um, and, um, and then, but, but then close friends, I would definitely share feelings, but only with my very, very, very closest friends. And really you should only have, uh, uh, one to three maximum people in your inner tight circle of that. Um, and, uh, hopefully one of them is a spouse, uh, and, and maybe, you know, uh, a couple of others. Um, but you don't, um, uh, you know, you need to, we need to protect our families. We need to protect our children. We need to protect our spouses. We need to protect our other friends. Um, but we need to protect ourselves as well. Um, so those levels of conversation need to be dependent on uh, how, what kind of trust has been earned by this other person. How have they invested in your life? How are you prepared to invest in their life? Um, so uh, um, I don't want to belegal this <laughs> much longer, but uh, with a child, um, we need to teach them this as well, right? Teach them friendship circles. This is appropriate to share with this person and help them gauge who is safe to talk to and who is not safe to talk to. And not just by telling them he's safe, she's not. No, let's help our children determine um, and discern for themselves and ask uh, critical questions of who might be trustworthy of their friendship and who would not. Um, all right. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know, and sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. 
Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't. <laughs> Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking to? All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's quite a fun video. Um, and then there's the male female dynamic in communication. All right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, which that so cleverly and, um, uh, in a funny way, um, <laughs> uh, modeled for us. So yes, um, um, dads, um, and moms, we need to keep in mind that when we're communicating with one another, there's the male uh, wanting to solve the problem and the female just, I just want you to hear what I'm saying. I just want to share my feelings or I just want to, uh, I just want to share and I just want you to listen. Right. Um, and that's, I don't, you know, that's just a thing with got men and women got little girls and little boys, dads, when you compete communicating with your daughters, right. Moms, when you're communicating with sons, uh, that's just another dynamic of communication we need to keep in mind. Boys, dads want to fix things, even little boys with their moms. If their moms are sad, boys will, my son would turn himself inside out trying to make me happy. Oh my goodness. He would, mom, can I make you a tea? Mom, can I, or he draw me a picture with crayons or, you know, even as a little boy, um, they just want to, they just want to fix things. Um, but girls just want to be heard, right? All right. So let's, um, let's move forward with, um, all right, communicating feelings. All right, so I want to. Um, uh, so it's important when your children are young, uh, and I got to say, there's not even a lot of adults that know how to express their feelings. Then that again comes under emotional literacy. Um, so being able to identify your feelings um, is part of emotional literacy or emotional intelligence. But then communicating them is a whole other thing, right? One thing to recognize: communicating is a whole other thing. So communicating by with an I feel statement, I feel blank uh, and, and, uh, um, to, and, and this is a much better way of problem solving uh, than you did this or I need you to do that. You know, um, it, it always starting with an I feel blank because blank. That is uh, the first step in healthy uh, uh, problem solving or um, dispute resolution. And so um, with, with, uh, when I work with children in, 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 our, in our, our mission with, with Hesed and, and Fire Athletics International, we teach this to the children right off the bat. Like within the first month of working with them, they learn how to express an I feel statement and they learn the process of disp dispute resolution. And we have a process that they work through. Um, and it's funny enough, they often teach it to their parents. So uh, we need to be able to master this as adults and then teach it to our children. Um, but yeah, so here's what we do. Um, I'm gonna just uh, stop share on this and I'm gonna show you what we put up in our uh, clubhouse or, you know, just the, the place where the kids gather. Um, okay, um, so um, this is just a kind of an image of what we have on the wall. So if you picture this, this is a scale on the wall that's like, I don't know, it's, what's that? I don't know. Uh, eight feet wide. I don't know. Maybe I'm optimistic about my arm length, but uh, yeah, it's it's probably about eight feet 
this way wide um, and, and, and it's a chart and they have these emoticons here. And so we ask the kids, um, I pick out which one you feel right now, right? Um, so they'll say if they're in the green zone, I'm calm, proud, excited, happy. Um, or if they're in the yellow zone, I'm surprised. I'm, I feel silly and giggly. I feel confused. I feel a bit nervous. Um, then we're in the red zone. I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm yelling. I'm aggressive. Um, and in the blue zone, I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm sick or uh, injured or I'm tired. Right. So this this helps them develop emotional intelligence, but then it helps them communicate it better. I feel, and then they look up here and it helps them decide, right? They can see the pictures. Um, it helps them decide how they're feeling. And it might be more than one, right? It could be, I'm surprised and um, I'm scared, which would be kind of in the nervous. Uh, scared actually would be in the red zone. Um, uh, and I feel, uh, I feel aggressive about it. I like, Ooh, I want to punch something. Right. Um, or I'm, I'm surprised and I feel hurt. I was surprised by what happened. It hurts me. I feel, I feel hurt. Um, um, you know, it could be a combination. So we, we ask them to fill in name as many as possible, um, to be as detailed as possible to increase their int emotional intelligence. And, um, so then, then we say, okay, um, well, what zone are you in? Well, we uh, ultimately, we want to be living in the green zone, right? But um, sometimes we are in the yellow zone. That, absolutely, that, that's okay. Um, we don't, as long as we're not camping in these, the, the, the yellow, red, or blue zones, we don't want to stay there, right? It's okay to feel tired, but we need to do something about it so that we move to the green zone. So we have a nap or we, you know, get more sleep at night. Um, it's okay to feel sad, right? Uh, King David was sad for four days when he lost his son with Bathsheba. Um, but it says um, after four, so he spent four days grieving and laying on the floor. <clears throat> and um, after four days, he got up, got dressed and went about, went on with his life. And, and so um, the, the, we need to reconcile sadness, grieve and move on. And we can't, we shouldn't be staying in these zones. So this, we also teach this to them about emotional intelligence um, is, is that it's okay to be here for short periods of time, but we need to reconcile it with God and move into the green zone. All right. Um, and then we ask them to, to, further improve their emotional intelligence um, <clears throat> and, 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 and the communication of their feelings is um, on what number. Um, so we can say, if they say, okay, I feel surprised and, oh no, I only feel like a four. It's, it's not a lot. It's just, it's a four or like, I was completely so surprised that I screamed. That's a 10. It's a scale of, uh, that's a, a level of 10. Or I'm feeling um, excited because my mom's having a baby and tomorrow um, <clears throat> the baby comes home and, um, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see her. I'm excited to get my puppy, you know, so they might be a 10, right? Um, so we're asking them to, to identify the feelings as many as possible. Uh, what zone are you in? Okay. And um, how much of that feeling are you having? Right. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and then what are we going to do about it? And that's that, that that's the, the kind of the step one through to, to, to the final step is, and now what are we going to do about it? Right? Okay, you're angry. Okay, that's fine. Um, so you're in the red zone. How are you going to get to the, or, or sorry, you're in the red zone. You want to get to the green zone. What, what, what number are you for angry? Usually if they're angry, they're probably at a 10, right? Okay, good. Now, um, let's tell me about it. Like, tell me about it. Why are you angry? Right. Um, okay. So then I'll explain why you're angry and maybe they're angry at you. Right. And then you can say, okay, um, what are we going to do about it? Let's solve it. Right. What are we going to do about it? Or if they're angry at somebody else, we can counsel them to say, and, and what are you going to do about it, right? Because that's what gets them to the green zone, right? And then you ask, uh, if they're angry at someone else, you ask, 
may I hold you accountable to follow up on that action step that you just determined, right? Say, I'm angry. This is what I'm going to do about it to get to the green zone. May I hold you accountable to get to that, to, to the green zone? Can I follow up tomorrow or the day after, right? Um, or if they're angry at you is um, that final step is, you know, will you forgive me? Or, you know, um, let, let, let's, let's, let's seal the deal. Let's complete this. All right. So um, that's just something that we do. All right. Let's get back to the PowerPoint. All right. So, yeah. So these are all just kind of emoticons, um, you know, to really uh, the detail, much more detailed. The one I just showed uh, we use for children up to age uh, 10. Um, and then after that, we go to more, um, uh, more detailed, uh, if they're able, right. If they're able, but it makes it fun for them. Right. Um, and even for us, to be honest, there's a lot of adults that cannot identify their feelings in a detailed way. All right. Okay. All right. So we're, um, we're almost done guys. So let's just, um, um, okay, so now remember, we're talking about the role of the father is to provide security. We talked about the environment of love. We talked about emotional stability. And uh, we talked about uh, communication. All right. And now um, um, uh, we are going to talk about right under communication. Sorry, we talked about, I'm sorry, I messed up here. Uh, we've been talking about communication. We talked about body language. We talked about levels of communication. Um, um, and now we're going to talk about crossing the inner bar bar barriers of communication. All right. Sorry about that, guys. So here we are. We're still under communication. All right. So here we are. Person A, doesn't matter, guy or girl. That's just picture. Um, but uh, person number one um, gives a message. They're saying something to person number two, the receiver, right? Um, but whatever they say, it goes through a filter. We talked about filters uh, last week, right? So the filter, um, filters might be there. there's a filter of criticalness, or they're tired, or they're loveless, or they're disinterested, they're preoccupied, they're absent, insecure, scared, overwhelmed, or uh, feeling inadequate in some way. So whatever we say comes through that filter, and that is the message that comes across to the other person. So let's just say I said uh, the, the term, oh, that's great. Oh, that's great, right? So if I said that in a in a in an overwhelmed way it would go like oh that's great like what well, just what i need more right um i could say it in an insecure way um how would that sound um oh that's great uh like in a concerned fearful way i don't know if i captured that well or not <laughs> um or, or preoccupied, oh yeah, that's great, um, right? Um, uh, you know, or, or, or this tired would be kind of the same thing. Oh, right, yeah, that's great, okay, uh, right? Um, so that message gets sent to the receiver and they hear it that way, the way it's delivered, right? Now they're receiving through their own filter, right? So of inferiority, uh, uh, let me, I, I'm, I, let me go through my example here. So let's say the, the sender says, oh, that's great. And their filter is preoccupied, right? Oh yeah, that's great. Like this, right? The receiver, maybe they're struggling with inferiority, right? I'm not good enough, right? So he's gonna interpret that to mean, he's gonna decode that to mean, oh, she doesn't even care about me. She's like, like, it's like, I don't even exist or like, like she doesn't care. I'm not important. Right. Or she's looking down on me. Right. So then their response is going to be based on that. And maybe that looks like you didn't hear a word I said, or you don't care about me or, you know what I mean? And, and the, and the, and the whole time, uh, what, was intended here was really what the you know it, it was great whatever was great 
do, do you see what I mean? So what I'm saying is um, the inner barriers of what the filters that are going on in our minds and our hearts at that moment, right? Dad comes home after a hard day at work, right? Maybe you had a fight with a coworker. Maybe you got fired. I don't know. But do you see how this breaks down communication when it goes through our inner fil filters of either something that happened just that day or things like inferiority. These are, these are things that, um, that are with you, right? Um, so everything is going to pass through that filter on a long-term basis, right? Okay. So this, this leads to um, a breakdown in communication. So we need to cross those inner barriers. All right. We do that through things like inner healing, for example. All right. Okay. Um, make sure I, I don't want to lose myself in my roadmap here. Okay. Right. So um, we're still in communication. The, the last part of communication. Here we go. Listening skills, right? Uh, got, uh, uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, listen twice as much as you speak. All right. So, uh, so the sender starts sending an I message uh, and not I think, but I feel, right? Like, for example, um, uh, there's a difference between saying, uh, I think, you know, it should be done this way, or I think this is a, but remember a deeper level of conversation, a deeper level of relationship is I feel, right? And particularly when dispute resolution comes, right? Um, all right. The listener says, uh, oh, right. This is in, uh, this is particularly in the scenario of dispute resolution or problem solving. So then the listener says, uh, uh, um, with the feeling until the senders. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is, um, this, the, the listener then should say something like, oh yeah, I can see that you're hurt. So let's say the, the sender says, I feel hurt. Um, when you, um, um, oh, try to solve my problem instead of just listening. Let's pick that one. All right. And, um, so the listener would say, um, staying with the feeling of hurt. Let's focus on the feeling. Um, oh, right. I can see you feel hurt. Okay. And I can under, I, I, maybe I can understand um, why that hurts. Or I don't necessarily understand it, but I respect that you feel hurt. Um, so it's, it's acknowledging and affirming uh, that you're hearing what the sender is saying, right? It's affirming them, right? It glues you, it pulls you together instead of gravitating. Remember in the, the video with her, with the nail in her head, um, you know, um, as soon as he um, acknowledged her feeling and her need, uh, it draw, drew them together. And then as soon as he pointed to the nail again, she pulled away again. <laughs> and um, so um, uh, only then if you need to move to solutions. Right. And then only when there's an understanding of the feeling, you move to the solution. Then and only then do you move to the solution. But remember, we talked about earlier with the emoticons is um, I feel you know, this, when I, when that happens, then you talk about why let's listen to all the scenario. And then what are you going to do about it is the final step, right? Okay. Uh, oh yeah. So an example, a, uh, I'll just do it like this sender receiver. Uh, I feel hurt. Do you mean that you feel hurt? <laughs> um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh no, I feel hurt. I mean, I shouldn't do it that way. That's not working well. So, so the sender says, I feel angry. Um, oh, do you mean that you're upset about your car getting to uh, crashed? No, what I'm trying to say is like, I feel mad because I feel um, like it came out of nowhere. It was just such a surprise. Um, Oh, so I see. I, if I, so am I understanding correctly when you say that it just was such a shock and it just came out of nowhere and yeah, I can see, I can see how that would be, um, make you feel, um, angry. All right. Uh, yes. That would be, yes. And so the, the, the sender says, yes, that's what I want you to hear. And then the, the receiver can say, well, how can I help? How can I contribute to that? Um, um, or um, even possibly 
how can we solve the problem, right? Okay. All right. Uh, physical safety, finally, last one, right? And a short one. So now the dad provides physical safety, all right? Um, so that means things like, um, you know, got to be home by such and such a time before dark, um, you know, just even around the house, no, you know, sharp objects are kept, you know, out of the way. Um, I would say, oh yeah, protect your daughters when they go out at night. Yes, uh, meeting meeting the friends, knowing who the friends are, who are they hanging out with. Um, if it's daughters, uh, you know, of, of dating age, um, you know, it's uh, um, insisting on meeting the, uh, you know, potential boyfriends that they come in, spend time in the home first with the family before they go out alone, you know, just stuff like that. But, um, um, and, and I will say, because I was, uh, you know, young once, well, no, I'm still young, uh, but I was younger once. And uh, I, um, you know, uh, of course, rebelled against my, um, uh, actually, my mom, my parents never really insisted on meeting my friends. They just said they trusted me, uh, which um, anyway, uh, I think it would have been prudent uh, for them to ask and say, um, we want to meet them first. I know I would have at the time, I would have rebelled. Like I would have said, you can't control me. You know, I would have at the time, but um, really what a daughter wants is for the dad to protect her. The ultimately, really, that's what a dad wants. Uh, so I would say, don't back down on that, even though they kind of kick up a fuss. Um, they, a daughter does want to be protected. So, all right, I think that's our last slide. Yes, it is. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to close the recording. And um, so next week is chapter six, which is the final chapter. And uh, we'll bring it all home, land the plane and, uh, and uh, have a good parenting plan moving forward. All right, we'll take care.